Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson. The past brought to life by those who were there. This week, from China, one of the most deadly earthquakes of the 20th century. The earthquake woke me from a deep sleep. When I looked around, I could see my entire neighbourhood was completely flattened. Also, we'll be on the streets of Liverpool during the riots of 1981. There must have been about 150 to 200 guys just throwing bricks from one side and, and, and charging with scaffolding, trying to penetrate the line of shields. There were vehicles burning everywhere. And we'll enjoy partying and bullfighting with Pablo Picasso. He had very little ear for music as a rule, but uh, he came to life when gypsy music was played. That's all to come, but we're going to begin in Guatemala and the coup that signalled that Uncle Sam was determined to play tough in the face of any perceived threat from leftist governments in America's backyard. The period between 1944 and 1954 was known in Guatemala as the Ten Years of Spring. Free elections had been held and resulted in a left-leaning government under President Jacobo Arbenz which had introduced reforms designed to share the country's wealth more evenly. Some in Washington saw that as a red threat, creeping communism. So, in 1954, the Central Intelligence Agency engineered a change of government in Guatemala. It was the first CIA-backed military coup in Latin America. Mike Lanchin has been speaking to the son of Jacobo Abenz, who was forced to flee into exile along with his father. Carrying anti-communist banners, jubilant soldiers celebrate victory following their two-week revolt in Guatemala. Colonel Carlos Amas, the rebel leader, is embraced by some of his supporters who helped him overthrow the Red Regime in Guatemala. It's the summer of 1954, and the victorious coup leaders are gathering in Guatemala City after their successful overthrow of the country's leftist president. A group of Guatemalan army officers, trained and financed by the CIA, are now in power. Arriving from Guatemala City is Colonel Elfego Monzon, head of the temporary junta. He has high hopes of becoming president of Guatemala, but so has Colonel Hamas. Then, when the few red outlaws who still menace the city have been quelled, free elections will again be held in Guatemala. It's the end of ten years of civilian rule in the Central American country, and President Jacobo Arbenz and his family are forced to flee. When we went into exile, he was extremely bitter about what had happened, for the betrayal he'd suffered. His struggle was for the good of the people of Guatemala. He had great ideals. He was left feeling very, very bitter. Juan Jacobo was the only son of President Arbenz. He was just five years old when his father was elected in 1950. It was quite hard for me as a child, because both my parents were involved in politics from when I was born, so I rarely saw them. I didn't really understand why until later on. We lived in a large estate, which my father had bought with his own money. I remember it had a huge garden. I had a nanny and a bodyguard, who also became my tutor. When I was three or four, I didn't go to kindergarten because, I later found out, there had been some kidnapping threats. For my own security, I grew up pretty much alone at home because my older sisters all went to school. It was a difficult childhood. Guatemala had a largely feudal system since colonial times, where the majority indigenous Mayan population lived in poverty while wealthy landowners took charge of governing, with the support of the United States. But in the mid-1940s, the US-backed dictator was overthrown in a popular revolt, and the country's first free elections were held. Jacobo Arbenz, a progressive former army colonel, became Guatemala's second democratically elected leader. Once in office, Arbenz pushed ahead with a reformist agenda. At the forefront were radical land reforms granting peasants access to vast swathes of arable land. The move infuriated Guatemala's largest foreign investor, the United Fruits Company, one of America's most powerful corporations. 
and it set alarm bells ringing in Washington, where President Dwight Eisenhower had pledged a worldwide fight against the spread of communism. In August of 1953, President Eisenhower gave his approval for an operation codenamed PB Success, authorising the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to begin organising and arming opposition to President Arbenz. I first realised the situation was getting serious when they told us we had to leave Casa Presidencial, the presidential palace, because of the threat of bombing from aircraft. I remember being told, get your stuff ready, the toys you want to take with you. We went to a house in Zone 10 of the city. It had a big garden. At times, we had to hide under the beds. It was an anxious time. The first group of anti-government rebels, former Guatemalan soldiers, had crossed the border from CIA bases in neighbouring Nicaragua and Honduras in mid-June of 1954. Newsreel from their time casts them as plucky freedom fighters. Guatemalan insurgents stand guard at a Honduras airstrip while newspapermen press near a lone plane seeking passage over the rocky wooded hills to the border town of Esquipulas, capital of the free Guatemalan government. The Guatemalan army, though still loyal to President Arbenz, feared that an all-out American invasion would soon follow. By late June, the Guatemalan top brass had lost their nerve and senior officers urged President Arbenz to go. On the night of June 27, 1954, an emotional and exhausted President Arbenz announced his decision in a radio message. Our enemies, he said, have used the pretext that we are communists, though the reality is very different. The next day, the deposed president his family and dozens of his close associates took refuge in the Mexican embassy in Guatemala City. People were sleeping in the corridors, in the stairways. Both floors of the embassy were full of people. I remember us having to go to the rooftop to play. My parents didn't like us going up there because there weren't any railings. Sometimes when we went to look out of the windows, which we weren't allowed to, I remember seeing demonstrations out on the streets people with banners against Arbenz. So you were inside the embassy with your parents for about three months. Did you see much of your father during that time? I saw very little of him. He was always locked away, smoking, drinking coffee and in meetings with all his associates who were hiding in the embassy with us. family were eventually granted safe passage out of the country, first to Mexico, then to France, Switzerland, Czechoslovakia, and then to the Soviet Union, where Juan Jacobo, still not even 10 years old, was sent to a boarding school. One of the things that really affected me was that it got to the point that I didn't really understand what was happening. I didn't want to ask my parents, they looked so anxious. It was starting to affect my schooling, to the point that my mother had to teach me to read and write in Spanish. After that, I began learning Czech. Then I had to start learning Russian. At boarding school in Russia, I used to look out of the windows when it snowed. Everybody else spoke Russian. Nobody spoke Spanish. I felt isolated and lonely, cut off from my family and my country. In 1956, the family moved to the relative stability of Uruguay. Later, they went to live in Cuba on the invitation of Fidel Castro. Juan Jacobo says that his father never really recovered his spirits and he died a broken man in Mexico in 1971, aged just 57. But there is one more tragic detail to this story, which Juan Jacobo only mentioned at the very end of our conversation. The pressures from being in exile were so great that my eldest sister killed herself when she was just 25. My other sister killed herself in 2004. It was all terribly difficult for the family. We'd been separated from all our childhood friends, our relatives, because of the circumstances of our situation. We lost everything that you normally have growing up. Stability, school, family around you. When I look back now and try to make some sense of it, all that we suffered, I've often thought about it in quiet moments and wondered why, why?
decía por qué, por qué, por qué. Juan Jacobo Arbenz later returned to his native Guatemala and in 2003 he ran unsuccessfully for the presidency. He's now 69 and he lives in Costa Rica. Mike Lanchin was talking to Juan Jacobo Arbenz, whose life and the lives of so many others was turned upside down by that CIA-backed coup in Guatemala in 1954.